Hello everybody, my name is Phil McDougall and you are on What Drives Reno. I have a very special guest here with us today. Uh, someone that I've had the pleasure to get, yeah, no, it's, it's you, he's looking the other way. <laughs> Aaron S. Hagar, thank you very much for coming on the show with us today. I got a chance to, to get to know you over the last week or two, actually crunch time yeah. in the last week or two. So <laughs> thank you very week. much for coming on board with of us today. Of course, my man, of course. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me, first of all, in the museum and here and anywhere else you've been placing me these days. <laughs> placing it's, you. Been, it's been a wild it's, week. It's been, it's been yeah. a crazy week. <laughs> Uh, so for those of you watching the show today, we are really, really pleased because we have a brand new exhibit here. It's the Aaron S. Hagar exhibit, and it just rolled in last Thursday, the yeah. ribbon cutting, and but we couldn't be more excited. So thank you very much for doing that. For those of you who have not come down to the museum, you got to check it out. Uh, but we're here to talk about you, oh. and uh, it's kind of a tradition, so the very first Awkward. thing we talk about, uh, it's all about you today. Um, First thing I ask everybody in the show is, what is their first car? And if there's a story you could share oh, about gosh. that first car. I think everybody's first car has lots of stories, especially yeah. if it's a four-seater. Mine was a two-seater, so that made it a little more interesting. 1958 Alfa Romeo. It was in, a, uh, it was in the rafters of my buddy's shop. Bruce, uh, good old Bruce, the Alfa guy. And uh, we, we had him take it down and, uh, and clean it up a little bit because it had been up there for a long time. And uh, yeah, 1958 Alfa Romeo, a little, uh, a, boy, a little tiny motor, uh, baffled oil pans, magnesium oil pans. That, that, that little thing was quick. Little, little thing was quick. You still have it? Or is that the one you told me about? Uh, that's the one I told that's you the about. One. I, okay. I went to uh -oh, go get it. Uh -oh. I would still have it, but Dad got impatient. I put it down there for safekeeping, and apparently that didn't work. But uh, I think, boy, I've got every story of my childhood in that car. I used to drive that car literally from, from Marin or, or the Bay Area all the way to LA, work in the film industry like for three days straight with no sleep and then drive all the way back to school. I was a maniac in that car. But I think my favorite story, my, my favorite story is my, my childhood friend, uh, Chad Grulock and I were in Malibu uh, I think we were at the Trancas Market and we had, we had, you know, there's always like, like celebr celebrities, you know, wandering around in there, you, you run into everybody, but it's Malibu back in the, in the, in the uh, 80s, you know, it's, it's, it's family. And Kathy Ireland was, was, in, was in the uh, uh, checkout lane, and she kept eyeballing us, you know, two young guys. And uh, we get in the car, and we're just about to back out, and she comes up to the front, runs her finger along the car, and says, cute car. You know, she had that little voice back then, and I'm like, oh, yeah, thanks. And Chad's like elbowing me in the shoulder, dude, dude, dude. That I'm was like, your intro. That and was I'm your like, chance. I'm like, I'm good, and backed out and left. <laughs> well, you, you, and he still you, tells that you, story. You to left day. her, so you can. Like, nah, you can say you good left for her. her. She's a su successful woman, but I wasn't into models. I wasn't that. I wasn't that kid growing up. You know, Chad was, but I wasn't. I I knew better. <laughs> See, it's, it's funny. We talked about the first car, and you just took me down memory lane really quickly. Because the very first thing I think of is the clothes back in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Did yeah. you ever have any of those moments? You look back, and you go, oh, my Lord. I can just tell you what uh, one of mine sure. was. My wife, I come back, and I pull one out, and I go, oh, my Lord. I had these <laughs> hammer time pants and this hairdo that you would have thought was like, what? Yes. And actually, I, I, I'm mortified to look at it. you have any of those kind of stories back then? Oh sure, I, I find old photographs all the time and just giggle. You know, it's like what what was Paisley? I used to wear Paisley and, and kilts and long sweaters. I was a total goth kid, so eyeliner and you know, I, I think my senior picture I was wearing teeth and, and scleral scleral lenses. Isn't <laughs> like that a, funny how you look monster. back and you go, what were we thinking at certain times? And a lot of that stuff it just comes back, comes back full circle yeah. again. Mm -hmm. There's some there's some outfits they here in the museum. Uh, back in the cars, like 1890 something, and I'm looking at those outfits. And I go, man, those are really old. And I look back on MTV videos or something, oh, and I yeah. go, they're wearing them again. They're wearing the clothes they wore back, you know, 200 years ago. So check this out. So my wife, just the other day, actually, wears this. Um, it's a, it's like a space shirt. You know, it's it's all it's what's left of it. It's all little space and stars and little nebulas and stuff. And it's got you know cut off sleeves and a and a, and a wide neck and a curled up you know bottom edge because I believe dad had that in Montrose. So in the 70s, he had that shirt and it used to glow in the dark. I remember it used to glow in the dark and, and he cuts everything. So it kind of nurdles along the sides, you know? And then I wore it in high school 
because, you know, that's just what you do. And now my wife's wearing it. My wife's wearing my pants from high school, too. I have some old guests, some old black guests, semi-high jeans, you know. But back then, I was like a 26, and yeah. she's like a, a zero or a one. Yeah. And she wears them. <laughs> that's the other part that kind of bums me out. I look back at some of that waistline back then. I go, oh, man, that was a long time ago. Yeah, you know. Listen, you mentioned Dad a couple of times. So uh -huh. people who don't know, could you just reference oh. who your father is? I might not sure. know. I'm, I'm part of the Hagar clan. And Sammy Hagar, he's, uh, you know, the ultimate adventurer. <laughs> he's the one that, that <laughs> stores your car, your first car for you. Right, yeah, he's the one. Yeah, uh, uh, don't trust the Hagar storage company. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <that's funny. laughs> yeah uh, car guy, musician, uh, uh, Cabo Wabo, Sammy's Beach Bar Rum, Santo Tequila. He just keeps going. He's the Energizer Bunny. Yeah, the real right. one. Yeah. No, he really, he's the original. He's the original. The well, let, let's jump in a little bit about the exhibit. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't be happier for those. I told the story the other day when we did the ribbon cutting ceremony, and I sincerely mean this. We were going back and forth in emails a few times, and I said, there's a lot of people I met, but when we first had our conversation, I knew you were the real deal. I sincerely oh, mean you. that. I knew you were the real deal. I went up there, met you in person. I said, this guy is, is amazing. Uh, you feel like you've known him your whole life. Uh, you, you really do. Oh, thank you. And it, it, well, not a lot of people can say that. And when the camera's on and off, you're the same guy. That's yeah. important, too. Yeah, people yeah. need to realize. There's probably been some people in your world that you've said, wow, the, they come off like so great, but then the camera goes off. Yeah. They're, not, they're not the same like, people a boring anymore. human being. This is the real guy, <laughs> on and off camera. Uh, so you oh, came in. You. you did it. You met with yeah. some of our Driving Force Club members. You had a lot of our volunteers yeah, really here. Fun. We had a good crowd. Uh, the exhibit is here at the National Automobile Museum. Started last week. It's going to be through the end of like, probably about two months now. And it'll yeah. go through some versions. You even had a brand new edition today to the exhibit. Yeah. People haven't seen you. You just wrote it in. Yeah, yeah. So we'll I drove it in. So, so the, the, the 56 Woody wagon, so they never made a Woody in 56. And uh, and, and I, I had this wagon that I was trading up from a $500 motorcycle, like over the years trading up for this wagon. And I had finished it and it was ready to go. And dad's like, I want that wagon. Let's make it a Woody and, and use it for the rum company. And I'm like, no, it's like, that's so much more work. And he said, I'll pay you for it. And I said, okay, but I want this much. And he gave me a much less and then i had to do all the extra work and but it was good because it's still in the family so it worked out so i, I, I got and a now it's in the right. museum and, and now it's in the museum to that's enjoy right it. so i carved all the wood out of at a vintage teak it was over 100 years old an old cabinet took it apart and repurposed it everything on that car is repurposed um built the roof rack and all the old surfboards are from the 50s and 60s the old rod and reel is from the 60s and everything in there is authentic and real and it tells a story and i love that car Took it out of storage after three years down in Dad's warehouse. Somehow that managed to be, you know, that preserved. Made it. That made it. And uh, uh, switched out the battery, put some air in the tires, some fresh gas, and drove it up here from Marin. Um, yeah, that's, well, it that's looks the amazing. way we like to build them. No I, trailers. No I, trailers. I, I literally got a chance just to look at it briefly because we came in it's here to do the show right away. And he literally did. He just drove it in yeah, there, literally. parked yeah. it in the middle of the museum. We came over to do the show, and here we are. And then you go finish the exhibit. Authentic. So, so tell us a little bit about what people are going to see when they come into the exhibit. Because it starts off, it's your history. About yeah. 80 feet of exhibit space, yeah. automobiles, motorcycles, a drawing board. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what Let you're me tell trying you, to project. Filling 80 feet is a big job. <laughs> I thought I, I got saw plenty of work. Up. I got plenty of cars. Oh my gosh, I did not. Um, yeah, it's really. First of all, I mean, thank you. I, I've never shown in galleries. I, I don't show in car shows. I mean, I showed in a couple of galleries for shows, but not regularly. And uh, and just bypassed all of that straight into museum. So thank you. The National Auto Museum. You went <laughs> right National to the National. Museum. I mean, my gosh. So huge honor. Totally took me by surprise. I got to say, I get a lot of crank calls, and I didn't really take it seriously. And and that's part of. The joy of the story is that I didn't really take it seriously. I didn't know what I, I was getting so, into. I can tell we're emailing back yeah, and, and I'm forth. like, oh, some casino but, thing. I'm but <laughs> when we spoke on the phone, we knew I it was real. Know. I, I know. I was such a fool, and I never came here. And one of those things that you just miss when you're working in food and beverage at 20 hours a day for 10 years. You just miss it. But here we are, and I'm thankful and grateful. And, yeah, I, the, I, I tried to tell a story. Uh, tell the story of the artist, tell the story of the craftsman and welder and fabricator and some of the opportunities I've had to build some really interesting cars for myself and then extend it into my family. Some things I've kind of uh, collected and modified and customized, some things I've had for 
15, 16, 18, 20 years, um, some things I got from other talented people and then used uh, for off-roading and like the motorcycle. Um, but yeah, most of it I, I built nearly from scratch or I've modified. Um, my car friends call me a, a cake decorator. I'm like, I'm fine. I don't have to make the cake. I can decorate it. You know, that, that's okay with that. But um, yeah, you kind of become a, a mechanic along the way, you know, when you start with a classic car and, and always own a classic car. I'm one to work on things myself. I am not a mechanic, but uh, you know, you learn some skill sets along the way. But yeah, you will see a journey here. Uh, like I said, starting with the artist and all the way up to current. Uh, we're, we're big overlanders and that's something we took to like everybody else during the pandemic. Uh, we did 9,000 miles off road in, in that year. So that was pretty good. That's Nevada was open, Nevada was open. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so hopefully it tells a story and fits right in. Well, tell us a few of the automobiles that are in there. Could you share sure, with yours sure. what we have? Yeah, we'll start with the Woody Wagon, which which we're just putting in now yeah. and I'll set up. It, it's, a, it's a great display for the rum, it's really cool. And then uh, my Morgan three-wheeler, which I've been dreaming about for a long, long time. That's a big hit. People are taking oh, a lot of photos of that. It's so fun. And I tried to turn back the clock, you know, because it's a 2013. It's a legacy vehicle, kind of a continuation um, from Morgan. So I tried to kind of push it back in time. And then uh, we have my TR3, which I've had for close to 16 years, I think, or so. Um, Once was my best friend's ex-wife's father. Uh, retired in the 70s, so most of that car is up to that point. Everything on it's authentic. And then, uh, what do we have? My old Mini Cooper, a mm -hmm. uh, Series 1, uh, a Mark 1, uh, 1960, a uh, little, little rally race car. And then the Pinscower. And yep. in between there, That's we have... That's a piece right there. Yeah, the Pinscower that, is very unique. Yeah. I've had that for almost 20 years. That was my winter vehicle. Mm -hmm. It took a quarter tank to get to work and back in the winter. <laughs> Not very economical, no, no, that, that doesn't but work. it would go anywhere, and that was the trade-off, is that I trust that thing. It's 24 volt. It would sit all summer, crank it up, fire it right up. I mean, that thing was awesome. And then in between is some bikes. We have the Cabo Alba race bike. I have my uncle's Norton that he bought brand new in 75, one of the first bikes I ever rode on, and he always had a matching Mini, and that's why they're together, because they're a pair. And then I have my, my Triumph uh, Tiger, which is uh, that's in really front cool. of the Pinsgauer, because um, that came from Katrina Lofton, her ex-husband, Mike Winkle. And that's how we met. Was how we met. And, and Mike was, uh, and the Yule brothers were part of uh, Eurocycle here. They started Eurocycle, and I bought that off Mike. That was his personal bike, and he built it kind of as a, a prototype thing before Triumph had evolved into all those mechanical things that they have now to make it off-road. That was kind of an early version of it, and he really dialed that bike in, so it's kind of one of a kind. And I've put another... 10,000 miles off-road on that thing and loved every minute of it. You, you shared a story with me, if you don't mind repeating, about mm -hmm. the, the motorcycle, the Cabo Wabo. Can you touch base on that, about the grassroots uh, sure. campaign and a little bit sure, of history? Yeah. When people come down to the museum, they have no idea how much that affected or influenced the campaign right, going right. forward. Well, the reason why that bike looks the way it does is because it is an old race bike. Um, I did have to replace some parts of that bike was crashed at Daytona, unfortunately, with a fatality. So um, I took what was left of the bike and with our original rider, Dave Wasson, our, our main rider, mm -hmm. and he and I put it all back together and put it on display. So I matched all the color to duct tape because he crashed so much yeah, that it was easier just to cover it with funny. duct tape. But we started a little grassroots ra race team when Cabo Wobble first started and dad was uh, marketing it. And I thought, you know, the fans do this and that's a great marketing thing and I was trying to get my buddy a ride because he didn't have a ride that year you know he wasn't sponsored and so we worked out a very modest agreement to put him out there for a couple seasons and we worked with some locals and they helped us out with the bike too and we we uh, we slept t-shirts every race to get budget for the next race and stickers and anything we could do to make money and uh, yeah we took uh, I think what 12 regional championships and uh, and three or four national championships, AMA, AMA, AFM. It's a big deal for a little privateer yeah. in the mid-90s, you know. Share the story cool. with me about even if the driver didn't win, he was what? Yeah, so Dave was so good. He really understood marketing. So even if he didn't win, 
he would make sure to be crossing the finish line with, with the guys that did win. He'd be doing a stoppy or a wheelie or just rolling as a he'd trio. Doing, he'd be doing his style. Yeah, he was doing style. his thing. That's so a good marketer. That's off to Even date. Even his last place, you're still there at the finishing yeah. line making it's, sure doing a wheelie. That's Exactly. Good. Cabo Wobble was always in the shot. So back then, <laughs> Cabo Wobble wasn't as well known. But it wasn't known at all. It's yeah. funny to see how far it's come. Everyone knows know. that name of that brand now. I know. It was one of the... The largest private sales, I think Oprah had the largest private sale of anything she had, any business she had started. Dad had the second, it was like 120 yeah. million or something. Wow. Good for Dad, I mean, it was yeah. awesome. And I'd like to think that Cobble Wobble Racing was a small part of that. <laughs> a big part of it. Grassroots, <laughs> that's where it all starts. Sure, sure. Well, it's just fun. We looked like a million bucks on the track. You know, being a custom painter and being an artist, I could always make us look good. And Dave rode good. All right, so for those who might not know you, and there's probably very few people that don't know you or know of you, <laughs> no. uh, let's just talk about a couple of things, because sure. you're you're an artist. Mm -hmm. We talked about that. Uh, I, I forget the phrase Heart you use. Heart and soul. Yeah. And you said something about metal. How did you say about iron and metal? You, oh, the uh, resurrection of old metal. Yeah, right. um, so, so the Rat Runner Garage is, I, I used to call it the... the um, the art of preserving and resurrecting old metal. Because here, when I moved to Tahoe, being a car guy, I had nothing. When I moved back up here, when I moved up here, I had nothing. I started over. Um, I was coming out of a divorce and literally started with nothing. So everything I acquired was either free or cheap or, or trade or, or, or trade like that. exactly. So, so I came up with this concept. Uh, I was trying to get out of food and beverage after ten years. It's a it's a really hard life. It's yeah. it's not my life. I served it for ten years, and I was and, and I was looking for an exit plan. So I I came up with a with a shop and and kind of an idea of what I wanted to do in a TV show and. And I had a little band project and just, just trying to do things that I was familiar with. Mm -hmm. And in that, I, I, I designed the Rat Runner's Garage. And it was just my place to play and kind of get back to center and work on old relics. Can, can you explain to our viewers what that is, the yeah, Rat Runner Garage? Yeah, it, it, it was just my place, you know, to just, just my little garage. Okay. And, and I, it started out... It's a pretty cool garage. Yeah, it started out on the back of a trailer, really, where I made my first car with used parts or free parts. And the idea was resurrecting old metal because Tahoe was was abundant with it from from the logging industry and the mining industry and agriculture. People were literally giving me old cars and trucks and pieces and parts, and that's why I got into the rat rod culture mm -hmm. very early. Yeah. Um, I saw Billy Gibbons' little little truck, and I built a truck very similar in my eyes to it, except without the surfboards, mm -hmm. and I did all aircraft theme. And uh, yeah, that became a show for a little while. I've done a lot of other TV shows with other people I've met in, in the industry and at SEMA. And that car's been to SEMA, the Woody Wagon's been to SEMA on invitation. Um, really, it just turned into this great life and it's kind of taken off and it's become a global thing um, with the culture of, of rat rods and custom culture it became very popular and I got on that wave and it was, it was awesome. So artist, uh, Entertainer, I've heard you got some pipes. I heard you rocking up there. That job was doing... already taken, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you I, I heard that. I heard I'm supplemental. Voices. I'm no, supplemental. That's great. So, what other things do we not know about you, or do people? Oh my gosh, uh, probably be interested to know. I crochet. Not you crochet. No, 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 that no, one I did no. not see coming anywhere. I did not see that one coming. No, I don't work much with glass. That's one of the things that that kind of became popular. I'm not part of that culture, but uh, I've, I've never done much of. Of that kind of stuff, but uh, but never played with glass. I've always been fascinated by, like I can't even cut flat glass for my hot rods. I have to have someone else do it. But um, but yeah, I played with some woodwork, and uh, you know I, I can't say I mastered that. But the Woody Wagon is is a lot of fun, and you know it's just it's just being a creative person. I think when you're when you're born into creativity, it just you just you serve it. You know whether it's an obsession or a commission or just. A need, you know, creative problem solving is a need, and and I, I got to exercise that in the food and beverage industry too, you know, to very rigid people. Yes, yes. <laughs> if you can get through that, you can get through anything. That was a great learning experience, let me tell you. Yeah, getting through that, that's yeah. Well, kryptonite. We, we got a couple of minutes left. Um, I know your your next one of your next journeys or projects. You're going to go somewhere. Uh, north, you want to share with the viewers yes, where you're going? Yes, extreme north. So can't get much more. Right, north. right. So we've always been hikers and backpackers. I grew up in the mountains, and and that that evolved into moto camping on the motorcycle. And I had the old pins used to take the kids camping and all that. And and then it, that's evolved into overlanding, you know, moto camping. And uh, yeah, so I built out a vintage Defender, uh, a 110, and I built out uh, a Jeep Gladiator. 
and uh, with Alucab and some other partners. And uh, and I've seen them; they're amazing. They're they're, they're pretty cool. Yeah. But we're doing the Arctic Circle, so this has been a couple year plan with a group that we overland with. I don't know if people caught that. He's going to the Arctic Circle. Yeah, and about yeah, a week not or Antarctic. So. There's the North and South, so yeah. we're doing the we're doing the northern. You're going route. up there. Uh, the most most northern point of Alaska, about 7,700 miles. So we're we're doing almost 10,000 miles round trip because we're doing both overland expos. So we're going to bookend expos one in Oregon and the ending one at the end of August in Colorado. So we're going to drive all of, uh, to all of them. But the intention is to take, to take both, both uh, rigs to, uh, to up, 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 up Alaska. So yeah. it's going to be amazing. And, and amazing. I, I had a chance to look at it and visit and, and give me a tour. Yeah. It looks like something you're going to see on one of these these movies. You know, or, uh, <laughs> what's that movie? The ter not the Terminator. Well, a little bit of Terminator, yeah. a little bit of a Transformer, a little bit apocalypse. of Transformers, a little bit yeah. of that too. It's got a lot. I don't know. Uh, we got about a minute Super or so fun. left. Is there anything you want to make sure the people watching today uh, know about what you have plans or if they want to follow you or what would you like sure, to communicate you can follow to me all viewers over. today? Yeah, you can follow me just under Aaron Hager. Are. The Hagar family is pretty active in the world. But no, most yeah. importantly, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you right. to you and Katrina and, and, and all the stewards of, of the museum and the curators. Being here is unbelievable. It was never even part of my, my dream list because it just, it just seemed like such a far thing. Like that's what you do when you're gone. You know what I mean? Um, so thank you. Yeah, you um, want to be around you, enjoy it. Yeah. And see everybody yeah, see it. And definitely. the social media has been has been great. People are okay. loving the exhibit. For those of you who have not seen it yet, the exhibit just opened on Thursday. Yeah. It'll be here for a couple of months. Yeah. And it's fun to watch you work. Because, Come see it. Because I can see you I can see you looking at it and I can see you go, well, and I'm going to put that there. And I can see your mind going, <laughs> getting creative. Well, I'm going to bring the Woody down, and maybe i got some other things yeah. I want to do. But yeah. the other part, too, he's the real deal. So when we had everybody come down and meet, you spent hours talking to everybody, oh, making sure. sure and answering questions. And every one of them said the same thing to me, one of the nicest men they ever oh, met. Oh, very kind. goes a long way. It goes very a long kind. way. And people see that, and they see it in your work. So we're very, very yeah. grateful to have you here. Thank you. And I have a feeling this is just the beginning between us. I think so, too. Much right, to so do. Thank you very thank you, much. Phil. I appreciate it. <laughs> For those of you watching today, if you want to learn more about the National Automobile Museum, just go to www.automuseum.org. We have a great exhibit. It's going to be here, the Aaron S. Hagar exhibit. It'll be here for a couple of months, and it's I think it's going to be changing. He's always doing something fresh. Uh, if you're not familiar a with the museum, <laughs> get familiar with it. Voted number one on TripAdvisor's, a favorite yeah. place to visit in Reno, favorite museum in Reno, 16,000 square feet. Uh, I'm sorry, 16,000. That's just our patio. Yeah, the that's river. just the patio. We're 105,000 square feet. Oh, I've been saying 106. Sorry about that. 106. <laughs> Every time I say it, I add 1,000 on it. 105,000 square feet. Thank you very much for following us today. Come visit us at the museum anytime, seven days a week, National Automobile Museum. Take care.